welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to return to the glorious channelings of Quo. For a better idea of Quo, check out my previous episodes. Quo is a channeled entity very similar to Ra in the Law of One and answers questions about awakening and metaphysics and so far we've dealt with a variety of topics such as how to find your guides, how to access your higher self, what the transition to the new earth is like and all of these have been very profound and I've found a lot from them. Today we're going to talk about the magical personality. The magical personality is a concept that was introduced in the Law of One material. For a better explanation of what the Law of One material is and what Ra is, check out my previous episodes. This is channeled work, but it is incredibly authentic and credible. And the best thing I can tell you is just to judge for yourself. But in this particular one, I want to talk about magic and the magical personality. I'm very interested in the concept of magic, of course, because I think we're constantly performing magic. The law of attraction is ultimately what magic is. But there is ritual magic that has occurred through the centuries that is discussed in the Bible. And there are rituals that people do. There is a good and bad or black and white magic that does exist. People perform. It's up to you to decide whether or not it's effective or not. But when we are imagining and using the power of our reality creation, there's kind of two sides to it. There's a loving side to it. And then there's the negative side where people try to dominate and only care about themselves. But when we come into our power, we come into what is called the magical personality. And I love the concept and way it's discussed in the law of one. I wanted to get a better idea and see what Quo had to say about it. Now, in terms of magic, Ra defined magical ability as the ability to use the so-called unconscious. They found Don Elkins a definition of magic acceptable, the ability to create changes in consciousness at will. Magic is the work of the adept. It is a sacramental connection undertaken at the level of the gateway or indigo ray, which is fed by the disciplines of the personality. Through magic, actions may be accomplished in the material realm, which may be considered miraculous because they exceed the known limitations of the illusion. Consciousness itself is the primary tool and means of magic, though it is typically facilitated through careful preparation and ritual. Those workings which carry a magical charge are working with metaphysical power. The heart of white magic, the positive use of magic, is an experience of the joy of union with the creator that joins body, mind, and spirit with the one infinite creator and radiates throughout the life experience. In the 55th session, Ra states that there is no magic greater than honest distortion toward love. And in the 64th session, Ra says the principle behind any ritual of white magical nature is to so configure the stimuli which reach down into the trunk of mind that this arrangement causes the generation of disciplined and purified emotion or love, which then may be both protection and the key to the gateway to intelligent infinity. Now, when you follow the law of one work, this was a channel work in the 80s and they would do a ritual before these channelings, which was the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, a powerful ritual that was taught to secret societies thousands of years ago in which people will call upon angels and offer a circle of protection. It's very powerful. I've done it myself. And they were doing it before this ritual to protect their own channelings. So they were performing some kind of magical ritual. Now, if you're coming from a Christian background, that can be quite scary. You think all of magic is evil, but there is a good and there is a white magic and there is a black magic. In this particular book, the evil or service to self side is so concerned about the law of one sessions that they send 
a negative entity to attack the sessions using black magic. So it is something that exists. I have seen it in my own life and I would love to get a perspective that is discussed by Quo. They talk about something called the magical personality. So a better understanding is when the higher self is properly and efficaciously invoked for the purpose of a working, it is called the magical personality. Upon this invocation, a bridge is made between space, time and time space. Consequently, the higher self experiences directly the third density catalyst for the duration of the working and the third density self takes upon itself something of a vestment, a consciousness that bestows magical perception and power. Desire, will, and polarity are keys in working with the magical personality, in developing the self toward the use of the magical personality. The seeker is counseled to pay attention to the qualities of power, love, and wisdom, so that the seeker, balanced in the center of love and wisdom, seeks power in order to serve others. In the course of a magical working, the first invocation is that of the magical personality. This is drawn through the gateway of the violet energy center. Great emphasis is placed on the proper releasing of the magical personality at the conclusion of all workings. So understand what is happening when you're performing magic and how it kind of relates to the creator in general. God wants us to all come into our godhood but there are limitations that we have, and that is love. As Neville Goddard explains, imagination without love, we could destroy the universe. And so God carefully gives us this magical power as we learn lessons of love. For if we come into this power outside of love, it is incredibly dangerous, and there are limitations. As black magic uses this magical power of consciousness without love, there are limitations that occur. While the magical personality is activated, it gives one the ability to perform, as the name suggests, magic, to work directly with intelligent energy through consciousness alone. It may be likened to donning a judge's robe, and while wearing the robe, the self is operating according to higher standards and responsibilities. So the question is, does Quo add to our knowledge of the magical personality as given in the Law of One? And there's a question in 1989 where they ask, the question this evening has to do with the development of the magical personality. How do we go about developing the magical personality? And what actually is it that we develop when we develop the magical personality? And of what value is it to us to do so? Carla is channeling and says that we come to you in gratitude and greet you in the love and the light of the one infinite creator. I am Quo. It is a tantalizing prospect to us, a marvelous avenue of service that you offer us, and we offer to you our humble thanks and our abiding love that you who struggle in the darkness still see and have faith in the light within. The question offered this evening has to do with the magical personality, but before we speak upon that subject, we must speak upon a subject that is fundamental to an understanding of the magical personality. That understanding is the simultaneity of all time, all space, and all action. This present moment is eternal. The past, the future, the feeling of being in the river of time are part of an illusion, which gives you who seek an enormously powerful opportunity consciously to accelerate the rate of your spiritual growth. It happens to be the last day of an old year and an old decade among your peoples who count by your calendar. Tomorrow it will be next year. Shall it feel like a different time? Shall it seem transformed? For the most part, no, because you are the same. You have always been, you are, and you always will be. The choices that you make in this density are predisposed by the biases and polarities that you have picked up in lifetimes long ago and more recent. When biases of love and peace and gentleness and humbleness of heart become your rest and your confidence, then perhaps you may release time and space, allowing it to be a useful and extremely potent offerer of catalyst to those who wish to learn lessons of love. You see, you are at the beginning of self-consciousness. You have almost finished this year in the school of eternity, this illusory time, 
However, the choices that you make are made in time-space and speak not to the outer world and its mundane concerns, but to the heart and the vital feelings of each. In this way, we may say to you more simply that the magical personality is an artifact of the one who has been able to focus the heart and the mind upon the infinite one. It is, in a way, possible to think of the higher self as being separate from you, but just as you were today and you will be tomorrow in a new year and a new decade. So the I am that is the core of you learns of love, of wisdom, and of loving, wise compassion. When these lessons have been learned to the extent that you are without significant distortion, you turn and reaching through time, you offer yourself a gift. You offer the biases and decisions and choices that have been made not up to this point alone in your illusion of time, but all the choices that allowed each of you to graduate into fourth density, perfect the lessons of love and learn the lessons of light to fifth density. When you manifest light and learn the true meaning of wisdom in sixth density, there is eventually in mid density, a point in which there is no longer any polarity for if all is one polarity, there is no polarity. It is when the spirit has reached this point, full of unity, wisdom, and compassion that the sixth density self places within the third density self in the deep mind, the biases which are to come, the destiny which has been fulfilled, the beauty, the exactitude of service to others. Therefore, the magical personality or the higher self is the last vestige of the self which contains polarity. And as you deal in a world illusion grounded in polarity, this gift can be extremely helpful. Many, many times one is faced with dilemmas and enigmas that cannot be rationally discerned. There is no logical answer. There is only the wisdom of the heart and the compassion of the mind. For this is what the sixth density of unity provides, the realization that compassion is not only of the heart but of the mind, that wisdom is not only of the mind but of the heart. How many times do your people turn from their heart, refusing to ask, refusing to open the door to the helper or comforter which waits patiently to be asked to aid in decision making of various kinds. Our message is very simple. We ask each to love the Creator with adoration and worship as one would normally feel for one's father, for you are truly sons and daughters of the Infinite One and within yourself infinite in your own being. The process of accessing the deep mind and especially the higher self may be accomplished best as we have often said by repetitious, persistent, and daily meditation, not lasting so long, but lasting as long as it feels as though you are in a holy place with the one infinite creator. Thus, meditation is always the key to opening the shuffle from the subconscious or deep mind to the conscious mind. The higher self does not operate by giving instructions, for that would be an infringement of free will and would cause paradoxes within the universe that are not desired. However, the call must go forward within meditation that you may be visited, strengthened, and renewed by a longer point of view, a vaster field of incarnations and of incarnational decisions. For as each knows, there is no thing upon your planet which is as it seems. You are energy fields, complexes of energy fields, with the energy holding you together, carrying you through life. It is well to be very kind toward this physical vehicle, for it is the means by which the computer of the mind may gently enter data from the deeper self, the self unperceived, even when praying or asking. Perhaps one day one awakens and knows that the proper or appropriate answer to a question may be perhaps it comes all of a sudden within meditation. There are as many ways to use the higher self as there are entities. How does one make use of the higher self, the sixth density portion of you? The first thing you must do is give up your physical reality. You are an illusion within an illusion. Mystery surrounds you. Consequently, as one asks for guidance from a deeper self, the higher self within, one opens a door that can only be opened by the seeker since the higher self is a far more clear, lucid, and defined product of your thinking. Yet, still, you will find it most helpful to blend the consciousness 
and rational mind with the deep mind, for they give you feelings and biases that are far more a part of whom we correct this instrument of who you are, what your essence is, than you may have by any amount of consideration of these matters within this illusion. Now, as each sits here, we shall attempt to give the process by which the higher self may be contacted. This is one way, there are many others. This is a way which we feel is simple and therefore easier to grasp. The first step is the acceptance and forgiveness of the self within this illusion. It must be clear to each one that one cannot live purely in a world polluted by constant negative thoughts and perceptions, cynicism and ugly emotions of fear, terror and the triumph of those who delight in terrorizing others. This is not the personality that you wish to use for that special time during which you are working with consciousness to accelerate the rate of your spiritual growth to heighten your polarity and to move may we say forward you do not need to gaze at the higher self as part of the self unless you wish however it is well to know that the higher self and you are timeless and whole and one now to attain a magical personality there is much which one can do and indeed must do to create the appropriate atmosphere for the gentle lover's touch of the rational mind into the deep mind this is a slow process for many and infinitely worth it once one has been able to contact that part of the self that is sixth density which has given back the gift to you within the deep recesses of your mind you may then have a much wider perspective a much more clear vantage point from which to view the life experiences which your incarnation brings to you we caution each against attempting to live in the higher self mode for any length of time past which one cannot hold the concentration and the clarity which the tuning the praying and the singing brings about you cannot plunder your own higher self without doing damage to the quality of information you receive consequently in putting on the whole armor of light as this instrument would say and accepting the self which seems to be in the future but is indeed yourself as a good advisor you are moving toward a centered position which will be most advantageous to you in using this deep and lovely resource of the mind. We say lovely because it is a considerable effort, a labor of love for the sixth density to create a thought form of all that it has experienced. It, the higher self or magical personality, is placed deep within you. It is not placed without you. It is not placed within your teacher or your student or your colleague. The magical personality is an artifact of the self this mystery clad being whose entire experience is recognized to be mystery we correct this instrument mysterious in preparation for the magical personality's development the first thing which one needs to accomplish is a full and complete examination of conscience not that you as an entity may judge you as an entity not at all but rather you may forgive yourself for you have forgiven all others have you not Yet you still hold yourself unworthy. This is not a helpful spiritual point of view, for the magical personality is based upon the fact that the spark of the Creator within the true self of each entity. Therefore, to begin working with the magical personality, one must first go through much searching of the mind, the intellect, the emotional biases that constitute that which you are at this time. This is not for the purpose of judgment, but for the purpose of grasping your essence at this time. Perhaps you wish to make changes, perhaps you do not. But to come into contact with yourself as a self is the beginning of the magical personality. The day-to-day -day personality wavers. It is happy, it is sad, it is active, it is passive. Life is easy or life is difficult. And all of this is within this illusion. The more attention paid to the difficulties of this illusion, the less likely it is that one will be able to access to the deeper mind of the magical personality. So we suggest to each that the table be cleared, the table of petty prejudice, any unfairness, stinginess, desire to manipulate others, and all of those artifacts whose bias is not helpful in gaining polarity towards service to others in the name of the infinite one. This preparation takes a different amount of time for different entities, and the end of it is still impossible to live within the higher self at all times. However, it is possible to clear the self 
for the special and sacred door to the self to be opened. We suggest that each begin a magical personality meditation with that which has been called of a white or positive magician from time immemorial. I desire to know in order to serve. I desire to use my subconscious mind to enrich, enliven, enable, and engage this third density mind and heart. It is impossible for most to keep this clarity over an extended period of time, and there is danger in attempting to do so. Consider yourselves as toddlers, just learning to walk, the spirit so young, so lovely, so strong, and yet so vulnerable. This is how the magical personality sees the outer portion of your behavior and thinking. It is perceived as that of a child who knows not what he does. When one turns one's will and faith to the quest for the philosopher's gold of great wisdom, then you may begin to see gradually a change within you. But firstly, you must accept that the magical personality is already your own personality for all time is simultaneous. One good way to prepare oneself for meditation upon the magical personality is to visualize each chakra in turn, beginning with the red root chakra and moving upwards, carefully clearing energies, carefully seeing your chakra centers glowing orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. When you have reached sufficient humility to be able to listen to advice from the higher self, that is not easily understood to be other than self, then we suggest you begin this clearing of the chakras so that you feel the light streaming from your head, for you have opened all your chakras, you have become vulnerable, you are ready to take a risk. Firstly, there is a tremendous amount of protection of the body by the body. We recommend to each that this be observed. For instance, the instrument blends the violet of the crown chakra and the red of the root chakra to cover the self with an energy field that is completely personal and denotes that which one is. Upon completing the encapsulization of yourself in the red violet of body protection, you will then put on a garment of light. That is the creator's protection, impersonal, loving, and infinite. During the meditations, it is helpful for those who call upon guides or angelic presences to do so, for that work which you are doing is work in which you are vulnerable, for you are open to learning, and you do not always have truly appropriate vibrations for this energy. This must be seen to carefully. The self must be gotten in order, cleared of the small change of life's miseries, cleared even of laughter of good times, clear to listen within to what has been called in your holy works the still small voice that is your magical personality it is well to call any whom you wish to call to aid in your protection this is not an illusion any more than you are an illusion within this instrument for instance evokes we correct this instrument it invokes the archangels Raphael, gabriel michael and ariel and with these four pillars standing in the corners of the room, there is an overarching golden dome for these principles of love called the archangels are most powerful and most protective. When you have prepared yourself for the meditation upon the magical personality, it is well to sink into the self with no pressure, no thought, no worry, and no wonder, but rather simply to open the door and invite the wisdom and compassion of the ultimately learned, balanced being which you shall have become to the self as it is. It is well when one wishes to work in consciousness with another by communication to make these same preparations, for by far the majority of those who channel are channeling their own magical personality, their own higher self, their uniqueness. And it is well when it is finished that mentally one acknowledges that one slips off the garment of light and moves back into the illusion of energy fields and the experiences that challenge you to love. The magical personality is one which is grounded in the deepest humility and in the strongest sense, paradoxical though it may seem, of the worth of the self. Like a string or a ribbon, this unrolling behind you gives you information at each present moment as you request it. 
Those who wish to maintain a magical personality outside the discipline of meditation may indeed work with the visualizations. To work with visualizations, if those visualizations are simply shapes, the square, the circle, the triangle. The discipline it requires to hold this image in consciousness is the same kind of discipline that an artist employs as it studies its technique that it may, in the end, be a better instrument through which music or communication or healing or living may use to allow you to be the shining metaphysical being that you truly are. It is not advisable, in our opinion, to keep the magical personality any longer than one is able to remain completely clear within. This normally limits that which the magical personality may do to very brief moments within the waking hours and to inspiriting dreams during those hours when the subconscious and the conscious move together in play, in ritual and in meaning. For woe betide those who act as if they were acting out of the magical personality when they are less than clear. May we say, this is extremely inadvisable, and that the student of the magical personality who does not wish to study the Tree of Life, the Kabbalah, and all those things which would inform one of the history of this concept, content the self with knowing that the magical personality lies within you, fallow and ready to bloom. When you call upon it, may you do so in humility. We hope you may call upon it often. But always protect the self before you open your vulnerable spirit to that which, though it is you, appears within the illusion to be another. For those who do not clear themselves excellently may receive any number of guides which would purport to be the magical personality, but which instead are means by which positive polarity is gradually lessened. There are several other questions in this particular session where they talk about the psychic greeting that occurs and how to differentiate negative entities, which I found interesting. But there was one particular question that was asked. Could you comment on how aware cats in our household are of these contacts of these negative entities and positive entities, and if they're able to participate in any way? Quo says, the entities that you refer to as the cats are quite sensitive to not only our presence, and others of the confederation of planets in the service to the one creator, but are also sensitive to the negatively oriented that would offer their service in their own way. The feline entities have, throughout the history of your peoples, been seen by those of a metaphysical sensitivity as being able to perceive much which is unseen to your physical eye. The cat has been utilized as the guardian of many temples in the past of the Egyptian race of your peoples, for this reason, and because of the sensitivity of the cat entities, the negative oriented entities find some difficulty in offering the full impact of their services when the feline entities are present. For there is a natural kind of guarding or protection that is offered by the cat entities. They are not always aware of each entity as an individualized portion or person as they are aware of you in that nature, but are often aware of a feeling, tone, or attitude, or ambiance that has changed or has a certain quality. Thus, it has sometimes as if the creatures sense a presence as you would hear a certain sound that would alert you to activity. The cat entity, however, is able to ascertain the nature of the presence, whether it is beneficial or deleterious, and will respond differently to each of those qualities. In another session, this one in January of 2008, they ask, what is your opinion of the use of which ritual magic makes of repeated ritualized behavior to seek and serve the creator. It seems to utilize the doubling effect in each repetition of the ritual seems to increase the seeker's desire and purity to seek and serve the creator. Would Quo please describe how we are as seekers of truth can bring this kind of magic into our daily lives. We are those known to you as the principle of Quo, greetings in the love and light of the one infinite creator in whose service we come to you this evening. We would preface our remarks by saying that the basis of all these thoughts which we offer to you this particular evening is love. One can move into a great many complexities and details in discussing how to live a life that is grounded in love and based upon the awareness that all are one and all things are the creator. Yet underlying every complexity and every detail is a single, simple truth. The one infinite creator and you and all there is are one thing. It is a unified creation, and the nature of that unity is love. Unconditional love is the one great original thought that has generated all these seen worlds and all the unseen worlds as well. 
Your question, my brother, moves into that area where the seeker has awakened so thoroughly that he has begun to seek to express the fruits of his new awareness. We do not need to remind each that the prerequisite for working to create a magical ritual of the entire life is an open heart, and the prerequisite for having an open heart is a freely flowing chakra body, with the lower chakras balanced and open and full power moving through into the heart and thence through the upper chakras and out of the crown of the head. When you become aware that this is not the case in your momentary estimation of your state of mind, then there is the need to relinquish the magical personality and move into that balancing mode or that trigger which has taken you away from an open energy system and an open heart is identified, loved, accepted, embraced, and balanced. Then, and only then, is it wise to move back into the ceremonial dance of the devotional life. We use the term devotional life because it is this instrument's term for a life which the principles of ritual magic of the white ceremonial kind are brought into the daily life, and it is a phase that is easier for us to say. Therefore, please understand that when we speak of the devotional life, we are not speaking specifically of a Christian life or any type of belief system that would be behind living a life of devotion to the one infinite creator. We are simply taking the shortcut of this instrument's vocabulary for describing the life in which the entity sees not only the possibility but the need for imbuing every aspect of the normal everyday life with magic. As the one known as Jim has said, the basic work of the magician is to create changes in his consciousness by an act of will. He does this very specifically in order to serve. There is nothing physical connected with the white ritual magical tradition. All the work that is done is work in consciousness. The work consists of invocation. One invokes one's own magical personality, and then one invokes characteristics of the creator or the creator itself. We may illustrate the principles of this type of magic by looking at the ritual that this instrument calls Holy Communion or the Holy Eucharist. The ritual is conducted by a priest. The priest prepares the congregation by reading from holy works, offering prayers and supplications, and then leading the congregation in a general confession of sins. In this confession, all is laid before the one infinite creator, given away by the self, emptying the self of all that is past. The priest then absolves those in the congregation, reminding them that Jesus the Christ came to love rather than to judge and that all is forgiven. Thusly, he prepares the congregation for the reception of the Holy Communion. He then turns his back to the congregation, or in some churches simply turns his mind and his attention away from the congregation, and he begins to pray directly to the one infinite creator. He remembers the actions of the one known as Jesus Christ in which Christ is breaking bread and drinking wine with his disciples. He tells them, take this bread, it is my body. Take this wine, it is my blood. And as he remembers this, with his priestly hands hovering over the bread and the wine, he is about to give the congregation, he invokes the presence of Jesus the Christ, that it may enter into the substance of the bread and wine. Magically, then, it becomes a living host, a living carrier for new life. As the congregation takes this bread and this wine from his hands, again he says the bread of life, the cup of salvation, and that repetition brings the energy of Jesus the Christ into the awareness of each of the congregation as they eat the body and drink the blood that has set them free to live a new life unencumbered by past sins. We describe this ceremony or ritual to you in some detail because we wish you to see the kind of change that a magical ritual is intended to offer. It is intended to create a change in consciousness, or as this instrument would say, a change in vibration. The intent is to lift the natural default vibration of each of the congregation by invoking the presence of the one infinite creator in the persona of Jesus the Christ. The everyday life is not spent in church and in the workaday world. Each seeker must choose to be his own priest. Each seeker is fully capable of taking on priesthood. Yet we would suggest to the seeker who wishes to live a devotional life that he become more and more finely tuned to an awareness of this momentary decision to become the priest rather than the lay person. For there is a qualitative difference 
between the actions of a lay person and the actions of a priest. When one is a lay person, one is framing the self without any particular power, metaphysically or spiritually speaking. When one styles himself as a priest, on the other hand, he styles himself as an entity who has become able to handle sacred things and to pray directly to the one infinite creator and be heard. You are naturally priests. The unnatural frame of mind in terms of your deeper nature is that of the lay person. Yet your culture has trained you all of your life to give your power away to authority, figures such as priests. Therefore, as you set out to live a devotional life, we ask that you take seriously the responsibility of priesthood. When you do not feel priestly, then it is well for you to refrain from expressing the form of any ritual. It is essential that the essence of the ritual proceed and inform the form. Otherwise, the ritual is dead and does not have power. It is not necessary, my friends, to be extremely judgmental or overly critical of the self as to whether or not the self is open-hearted and working with an open energy body system. Indeed, after a certain amount of practice at remaining in this frame of mind of the priest at all times, it shall become familiar enough to the seeker that there is no longer the concern for whether or not one is in tune. This is due to the fact that once an entity has become accustomed to living in a priestly manner, any aberration from that tenor of mind will be all too obvious to the entity and will constitute that which needs attending as though it were a pain in the body. It is for the beginner that we offer these warnings. We place them here because it is essential that seekers see the difference between actions and essence. One may speak in ritualistic ways and move in ritualistic motions and yet fail to live a magical life because the heart is not open and love is not flowing. As the one known as Paul said, without love, I am a clanging gong. The most intricate of rituals is always founded on love. That is the prerequisite. Therefore, we encourage each to do the work necessary to support a devotional life. There are all too many of your peoples that have sought the life of a religious recluse because of the great yearnings for the infinite creator. Yet, because the form remained that which was understood and not the essence, the hunger remained and even grew despite the monastic schedule of six worship services in each day. That being said, let us look at some ways to think about the devotional life lived in the rush of the workaday world. In a way, it seems an odd fit to make of the everyday functions of life a ritual. Yet each and every portion of the life is entirely prone to and grateful for sacred use. In order to illustrate this, we would take an example from this instrument's own life. Each day, this instrument and one known as Jim come together at the end of the working day for a bath. This instrument has physical limitations which make it helpful for the one known as Jim to interact with her, far more than most husbands and wives interact when bathing. The one known as Jim draws the bath, opens the oils and lotions that will be needed after the bath and places them ready and invites this instrument into the bathtub. He helps her sit down and together they enjoy their whirlpool and the cleansing of their bodies. When they are both clean, before they leave the bathtub, the one known as Jim takes two pieces of ice in holders and for two minutes ices this instrument's back which alleviates the arthritic pain in her shoulders and spine. When this has been done, the instrument lets the water out of the bath and puts the shampoos and other accoutrements of the bath away and then is helped out of the bathtub by the one known as Jim. He helps her rub oil into her body and dries her off and then puts lotion on her body working to replenish sensitive skin that is always very dry. At the end of their bath ritual, they are both clean. The instrument has accomplished all that she needs to accomplish with the help of the one known as Jim. And in all of the intricate movement, there have been no words, for each knows the dance, and each makes of the dance as graceful and beautiful a thing as can be conceived by both of them. Here it may be seen that the form of the ritual is very homely. There is nothing special about the ingredients of the ritual. They are soap, water, oil, and so forth. Yet, the love that streams between husband and wife, as the one known as Jim helps this instrument with her daily cleansing, is palpable and powerful 
and supports and encourages each in his own individual metaphysical life. There are two things that we would note about this ritual before moving on. First, the one known as Carla during the whirlpool portion of the bath actively works with angelic presences, mentally expressing her love, thankfulness, and joy, and rededicating herself to the service of the one infinite creator. By doing so, she charges the water, acting as a priestess for both, although this too is never spoken. Secondly, the dance of the bath moves into the succeeding moments of dressing and moving into the next item of the day in ways which link and tie in the energies of love, cooperation, and mutual participation in the dance so that the dance does not end with the bath water is drained. In ritual, there are two kinds of form. There is the form of movement and there is the form of words. Behind those forms of motion and speaking lie the thoughts of the magician who is speaking and acting. To a magician, there is no empty action. The dance is always ongoing. At the very center of the dance, always there is love. The magician invokes aspects of love, standing on a plinth of love, surrounded by love, and seeking only finer and more sensitive attunements of that love. There are a finite number of movements and words within any day. There are a finite number of repeated activities which lend themselves to ritual. Consequently, to an entity whose mind is focused on filling the form of his day with the essence of worship, it is not an exceedingly long process of thought to visualize every single repeated action of a normal day. Each entity's day will be unique to him. However, the work he does in a day will have a certain aspect of it that are repeated. Therefore, the seeker who wishes to create the devotional life in the midst of the workaday world shall set his mind to analyzing each action of his day at work, at home, and on the road. The one known as Carla, for instance, has in her work environment the computer. All of her work is done on the computer. The one known as Jay, on the other hand, has in his working environment various types of large equipment such as mowers, blowers, and weed eaters. It does not seem to the untrained mind that computers and mowers be likely targets of a devotional life, yet we would suggest to you that whatever the nature of your work environment is, you can fill it so full of devotional essence that your workaday world positively sings. Most entities have a transitional environment between work and home because of the omnipresence of the automobile or other forms of transit. Most entities work in a place that is not their home, and this too is a type of environment that at first glance seems inimical to being part of a devotional life, yet we assure you that creative thought about the essence of the time of driving or the time of riding shall offer to the mind of the seeker repeated actions which may be infused with the invocation of deity. All motions may be thought of as a sacred dance. All words may be thought of as a sacred ritual. It is in the home environment, however, that most of the fully repetitive actions of the day are performed. The washing of the clothes, the washing of the self, the preparation and eating of food, the preparation for bed and sleep time, and the rising from sleep are all inevitable in their repetition. Consequently, they offer the deepest resource for one who wishes to live a devotional life. This instrument and the one known as Jim have long created times of offering and worship at the beginning and end of the day. They've also formed the habit of remembering before food is ingested to thank the one infinite creator and thank the food. These are far more outer terms and type of ritual than the kind of ritual which we have been speaking, and yet it is helpful in the devotional life to set aside times that are specifically dedicated to worship. This enables the seeker to deepen his base of insight as time goes on. It is possible in this way to create of the entire life a dance that is an invocation of the one infinite creator. The element of repetition is a substantial part of a magical ritual. Something that is done once, no matter how beautiful, remains single. When that beautiful thing begins to be repeated, there is indeed the doubling effect. That is, each doing of that repetition with full awareness of his sacredness doubles the power of that ritual. The one thing that is missing in terms of this repetition, when the priest is creating his own sacred life rather than being part of a group ritual, is that he is not calling a significant amount of the entities who have shared in that same ritual. For instance, in Holy Communion or the Holy Eucharist, many of the words of that service have been expressed in relatively undistorted form for centuries on end. 
Therefore, when an entity begins to pray in any one of the key prayers of that ritual, such as, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord Most High. A significant amount of those who have been Christians in an incarnation and who are now between incarnations living in the inner planes are drawn to those words so that one entity saying that particular prayer can excite and attract a tremendous amount of heavenly help with the repetition of that prayer with heartfelt energy. Contrarywise, one who's living a devotional life that he has created himself is doubling his own power but not calling a large amount of those who dwell in the inner planes between incarnations with one exception. Angels are not drawn to a particular song or a particular set of words. Angels are drawn to pure essence, having never taken part in incarnation. Consequently, any living of a devotional life will attract angelic help, so that there is indeed not only the doubling effect or amplification of one's personal power, but the supporting and undergirding effect of angelic support and encouragement. In closing, we would simply say that we cannot iterate often enough the importance of moving from love and from essence in creating a devotional life. If there is not love in the repetition of holy things, then that thing, while not wasted, is diminished in its power to comfort, heal, and succor the seeker. Therefore, do not be caught up in the forms of devotional life, but rather be caught up with the emotions engendered by having an open heart, an open body, an open energy body and experiencing the self as part of the dance of the one that is ongoing because he exists in that creation which all things are indeed one coordinated eternal dance in another session in february of 2006 the group asks about archetypes now i haven't really gone into the archetypes in the law one which will be a whole other session we all are a part of this overall archetypes of the creator and Understanding these archetypes, which are indicated in the tarot, can be magical. And so they ask, how does working with the archetypes to become them help us in the development of the magical personality? Quo says, your query this day, it revolves around the use of the archetypical mind and its study within the process which you have called evolving the magical personality or becoming a priest or an adept. We realize that the one known as T has been concerned about the issue of adepthood and priesthood, and therefore we would like to address this concern as our first topic of discussion, for we feel that it bears much of import. Not only of the one known as T, but this instrument as well is cautious when faced with the possibility that one might, by asking a certain question or following a certain line of inquiry, be committing oneself to the full requirements of a lifelong intensive study of the magical personality the tree of life, and the inferred duties and responsibilities accruing to a member of the white magical priesthood, that surprisingly large and largely unknown group of entities who, for millennia of your time upon your planet, have maintained stewardship of the earth, of those energies beneath the earth, and of those energies within. What this instrument calls inner or unseen planes, thus working ceaselessly, and without any regard for personal fame or renown to balance your island home. On its keel as it sojourns about your sun and as your sun sojourns about the edge of the galaxy. By identifying with their native mountains, plains, and oceans, by calling down the highest of the high, and by dealing fearlessly and constantly with that which this instrument calls the shadow or the unknown side of self, this priesthood has served ceaselessly. And there is that energy within many of those in this group that resonates to the idea of a life lived in service and a life lived in priesthood. We are aware of the concern within this instrument and the one known as T that there might be any hint or shadow of ethical commitment that would be beyond that which entities living as you live in the lives that you live could complete. We wish to assure each that those mental reservations create in the metaphysical world, a contract not to be such a priest. There is a limit that you have set upon yourself. You wish to relate to the world directly. You do not wish to go into retreat from the world. You wish to engage in the world. This is acceptable within the limits of a more generalized conceptualization of the commitment to living life as a priest or an adept. There is a general sense in which every entity is a priest. 
It is said in your holy work that you are a nation of priests and holy people. We believe this to be precisely correct and, as several of you have noted during the weekend's rich conversation, which we have greatly enjoyed being a part of through this instrument's mind, the priestly aspect of your incarnations is becoming and more and more clear to you. You are becoming more and more aware that you carry within you the consciousness of what this instrument calls the Christ or unconditional love. That which you are pursuing so relentlessly, that being the one infinite creator or alternately the truth about yourself lies waiting for you not outside your awareness, but rather at the very heart of it. You seek for that which is within your heart of hearts. In that way, adepthood or priesthood can be seen as the movement into the outer courtyard of the heart and into the inner door to the sanctum sanctorum, your heart of hearts, and the throne of the one infinite creator. Or is it instead, my friends, a manger? And does the creator await you as a child or an infinite lying in the straw, waiting for you to swallow it with your recognition of the Christ within? Do you seek an authority figure in your heart? Do you seek a white-haired ancient Lord of Lords, the, that Old Testament figure that judges as well as loves? What figure do you have in your mind that partially reveals and partially hides the truth of creatorship? What do you seek? Do you seek an image? Do you seek an icon? Or do you seek that mystery which lies beyond all words but bears the name of unconditional love? Therefore, on this point, we would say to you, that if you genuinely, sincerely, and honestly seek the truth of your own being, and if you are willing to commit ineluctably and simply to living your life in the pursuit of that seeking, you are worthy to be called a priest and an adept. You may not be able, because of your lifestyle, to commit hours out of each day to the ritual involved in priesthood as it is seen in holy orders. You may not be able to invoke and evoke specific energies at a specific time in a ritualistic manner, for that would indeed take a great deal of subtle work in visualization that would require you to maintain a level of focus given only to what this instrument would generally term madmen, saints, and fanatics. Such is the nature of priesthood. We expect and understand this is not the level of your commitment, and we specifically express our understanding that this is ethically acceptable in terms of the metaphysical balance not only of your individual life, but also the life of your group as you experience yourselves during this gathering and that group which is the tribe of humankind upon planet Earth. Your service is acceptable as it is, just as it is, and without improvement. You are already upon what we would term a sound and good path. And we thank you for being on that path, for calling us to your group, and for being ethically conscious and concerned enough to have cautionary feelings concerning these questions. We turn now to gaze at the magical personality. The definition which is this instrument has learned from the works of the one known as William is simple enough. A magician is one with the ability to affect changes in consciousness at will. You have been a magician each time that you have faced a situation in life and made a conscious choice to respond to catalyst that has offered you in a way which is not automatic in your responsive system. When you have chosen a higher path, when you have chosen a soft word instead of a harsh one, a kind action instead of a rude one, or an honest if hard answer instead of a hypocritical though easy one, you've acted in a magical way, choosing to lift your consciousness to a higher path. This instrument calls a good deal of this kind of work that she does tuning, and we would agree there is something to be said to, for seeing the tuning of your consciousness in this figure of speech. What is it to create changes in your consciousness by an act of will? There are three basic factors weighing on this matter. The first is yourself as an actor and a chooser. Second is your will, its recognition as a factor and its discipline by your daily work. The third, which you affect as an act of will, that choice that lies before you that is entirely subjective. No two people see Catalyst in precisely the same way. Therefore, no two people as magical entities shall create the same change in consciousness. It is the right use of will that becomes the key to the working of the puzzle that lies before you when you face a choice in how to respond to a situation that you perceive. It is in the state of your mind 
as you approach the present moment that the use of the archetype lies. The archetypal mind, as has been iterated often during this gathering, is a resource of the deep mind. It is a plat, if you will, of energy paths that are possible within the system of illusions that constitute space-time and time-space within third density upon your planet. It is a finite, delimited resource created for use by third density entities within incarnation upon planet Earth. It is a comprehensive encyclopedia of what this instrument has several times called the roadmaps available for getting from here to there within the inner geography of that infrastructure of roads, by road lanes and little tiny paths that constitute ways in which you may turn and make choices when you are investigating how to respond to that which you see coming into your view in the present moment. Most often, you use the archetypes inadvertently. You become one of them by moving through a situation with a certain degree of purity. We cannot be more specific than this, for within each situation there is a wide range of ways in which you may be pure, depending on how you are assessing the situation that you see before you and from what standpoint you are assessing it. There are many levels from which you may view consensus reality, and from each level there are many choices that you make. Before you make the choice of how to look at a given situation, which bring you to the point of choice, biased, or distortion in a certain set of parameters, all of which are useful, we have often said through this instrument that there are no mistakes, and in this wise we would say it with a special emphasis. When you are working with that which is quite nebulous to the conscious mind, you must not restrict yourself to the concept of being right or correct, but rather offer yourself permission to explore resonant paths of seeking. When you feel that you may perhaps have evoked or become part of the archetypal part of the human experience, that does not mean that you have moved from humanhood to an archetype. It means that you have hollowed yourself with enough clarity, honesty, and purity that you have made room within the dedication of your seeking for your experience to be filled with the resonance that moves from finity to infinity, from specificity to locality, to universality or non-locality. Becoming an archetype is a kind of knowing that does not depend on fact, detail, or learning. Touching into the archetypal is touching into the entirety available within specificity. It is certainly not available consciously or by application of learning or analysis. Archetypal truth is essential, and as several have suggested throughout this weekend, that which is archetypal remains forever mysterious. So that it is by your being that you explicate and bear witness to that which is pure or purified within you. This instrument would call this purified substance feeling or emotion, and we would agree that these words are the words closest to describing those rivers of energy that water the land of archetypes, that rich mountainous treasure trove in which one range leads to another and to another and to another in an unending set of discoveries and realizations. That which is magical within you awaits your choice. Let us look then at the nature of the choice before you and the resources which you meet it. In each moment, your choice is to accept yourself as the self that your culture and your environment suggest that you are, or to accept yourself as something far more articulated. It may seem grandiose to those who like the idea of being powerless and without responsibility in any ethical sense. To those who are thirsty for the one infinite creator, it seems a positive blessing to be pulled forward by the desire to seek. Those who wish to become more than they know are those who choose to become co-creators with the forces placed into motion at the time of birth. When you choose to accelerate the pace of your spiritual evolution, you are activating a magical portion of yourself. That is the nature of your choice. It is perfectly all right to choose to rest and refrain from the practice of the recognition of the power of your own being. When you have gathered your strength and wish to step forward upon your journey, you are indeed the fool. Whether or not you feel that you need baggage, you pick up yourself, your energies, and your intentions, and you leave the familiar, safe, and sheltered valley of your past understanding. Thus, all entities conceiving of themselves as working on their magical personalities may also conceive of themselves as being upon a journey in common with many 
many others. This is a pilgrimage in which you are never alone. Certainly each entity is solitary within the confines of its own choices and its own processes. However, other shards and splinters of the sunshine of the Creator are walking beside you, praying for guidance from the same Creator, being shined upon by that great and unending source of light and love, gaining inspiration from the same guidance. So, although in some ways you are endlessly alone, if you can open your awareness to the larger vision of your situation, you may see that you walk with many in a space made sacred by each footstep, each tear, each sigh, each moment of rejoicing, each time of wonder, amazement, and awe, and each midnight of suffering and woe. These are all most sacred. That which surrounds you upon this journey is a many-storied, almost infinite world. As you move the focus of your perception, you will choose to focus upon certain portions of the 360 degrees of investigation possible to one who is fully able to turn and gaze in any direction. Each time you change the focus of your seeking, something will be illuminated and many other things will be cast into the darkest shadow. You will always be working in what seems to you to be poor light. If you gazed at the many indications in the tarot cards, images of the sun, the moon, and the tendency within spirit of the moon to overshadow and hide the sun, that is the environment you are seeking. You may never become able to invoke archetypes or allow them to come into your being and fill you with the skill and the art of the true magical adept. You may have to content yourself with what you yourself consider to be imperfect attempts to invoke or become the archetype. We assure you that in the process of forming the intention, at each moment that you form such an intention to seek to serve the one infinite creator, to heighten your devotion to the one infinite creator, or to increase your passion for developing your will in order to maximize your service to the creator, you have done work that in a magical sense is highly polarizing regardless of the actual outcome of your intention. Make the shift with your mind of the doingness of consensus reality to the beingness of time, space, or metaphysical reality. Realize that those things which in the physical are mere shadows, that is your thoughts, becoming living, breathing objects, essences, and creatures in the metaphysical world. Your intentions are very real, metaphysically speaking, and your subsequent actions, metaphysically speaking, are as the shadows of those intentions. That which may seem glorious in consensus reality may have almost no weight in the metaphysical world and that which seems only a shadow in the physical world may have a tremendous weight in the metaphysical world thereby turning logic on its ear and all of your ambitions to dust please allow that to happen forthwith if there's any materialistic implication having to do with actions that are real in space-time release them my friends and know that your work is the work of the crystal that wishes to tune itself for each of you is a creator, and you are a creator in a certain way. You're an instrument. You have certain characteristics, much as any crystal does. You are set up with regularly within the logic of your own structure, metaphysically speaking. Your energy system is balanced in its imbalance in a certain way that works, and that is your perfection at this time. It is a stable setting. The one who wishes to adjust the setting of the crystal is one who wishes to do magical work. You are working with the structure of your own consciousness in order to improve your tuning or your setting as an energy field that is receptive, much like a crystal radio is receptive. This instrument has before used the analogy of herself as that which can receive a radio station. When she attempts to tune for channeling, she's tuning for the highest and best source of information that she can receive as a stable conscious entity. She's tuning the crystal of her instrument when she's done that to the best of her ability, she consciously sets and crystallizes that setting, and then she carefully chooses the recipient or source of the contact that is going to channel. In a less formalized and much more everyday way, everyone at all times is receiving the love and the light of the one infinite creator and is transducing it to a certain extent as it moves through the energy system of the chakras. By the time it leaves your energy system at the violet ray moving through into the octave ray of the crown chakra, it has undergone the adjustments necessary to move through your energy system. If you're resting on your default setting and not attempting to tune your instrument, 
then your signal, shall we say, shall be correspondingly unfocused and weak. Depending upon the work you've done in the present moment, meeting those situations that you see in your present moment, your output may well be in much different than your default setting. You may have chosen to work with energy of the one infinite creator in several different ways, sharpening it in this way, diffusing it in that way, and so forth. If you as a crystal being have come to a point within your incarnation where you are relatively restful and content within yourself, then you are probably allowing a good deal of light of the one infinite creator to pour through your system undistorted. Discontent and worry is the one perturbation that will most effectively destroy the energy of light. Consequently, as you work to be more and more comfortable within your own skin, you're not being selfish. You're not taking too much time for yourself. You are rather working in service to the Creator and to others by clearing your own energy system. It is not selfish to do this work, but rather of service to others. It is a very difficult tangle within the mind to many service to other oriented entities to be able to set aside the time and attention for oneself that is indeed needed for you to keep clear and useful and an instrument for spirit. Nevertheless, you may have to take that time, five minutes at a time, around the edges of the busy day. But we assure that if you choose those five minutes carefully, if you pour yourself into those five minutes, you shall create magic, a plenty. You shall not run out of time for you can do much in a small space, magically speaking. You are attempting to take that which your culture has taught you is worthless, your thoughts, your feelings, your hunches, and your intuition, and to glean from them the information that your culture has not respected or honored. In doing so, you are bereft of the tools comfortable to one who deals with the mind, for in doing magical work, or in attempting to create one's focus for being increasingly magical, you're moving constantly to move from head to heart and from thinking to knowing. What is the faculty of knowing? The one known as S was speaking this weekend of the difference between that energy that comes through the soles of the feet and up through the base chakra or the red ray chakra and pours upward out through the top of the head and that energy is called forth by seeking. That energy which is pulled down through the gateway to intelligent infinity by the force, the focus, and the purity of your desire. The one known as S noted that the place where those two energies met was at that point at which the tremendous energy of what you call the Kundalini lies, the object of the Kundalini movement being to create the evolution of spirit that is symbolized by the trope or figure of Kundalini. That place where the Kundalini rests within you is that place from which you may most stably and faithfully work. Attempt, then, in preparing yourself to do magical work to, as this instrument has said, become truly humble and empty. Examine your chakra system each day, looking for distortion, either overactivation or underactivation. When you find it, sit with it, gaze at it, invite it, and seek to understand what is triggering your attention on this particular issue. If you can find distortion within yourself from which it, this fountain of triggering effect stems, move to the origin of that trigger and see what you can do to unearth this buried treasure of it. By removing the gift from its surrounding ore, create the appreciation of the diamond that you have made from your suffering. See the beauty of its purity and know from experience the tremendous pressure of suffering in the fiery furnace of the catalyst of an incarnation what it has cost you to produce this beauty, this truth, and this treasure. Spend time, if you can, in the silence each day. We do not concern ourselves with your mode of entering the silence, or what you do during the time. You may do nothing. You may have a practice of prayer, visualization, or other regularized or ritualized method of structuring such time, or you may simply go on a solitary ramble listening to the calls of the birds and gazing at the beauty of the trees, brushes, and the meadows. However you structure this time, we encourage you to commit yourself to a daily practice of the presence of the one infinite creator whose voice is only heard in silence. Lastly, we encourage you to practice the recognition of the creator. Know it when you see it, whether it is within yourself, within nature, within others, or simply within the moment itself. 
We thank you for this question. As always, we have barely scraped the surface of this fascinating and deep topic, but we thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts with you. In another session in 2008, they ask, what would you say the difference is between what you described as consciously putting on that vestment of magical personality and consciously taking it off? and an entity such as the Buddha who has awakened to the All-Self. We are those of Quo and are aware of your query. The All-Self of the Buddha was a long time in coming, my brother. There was the walk of humanhood and all the explorations that the called for before the one known as Gautama came to the awareness of his own divinity. This entity expressed his divinity by becoming a ferryman and ferrying people back and forth. It is typical of mythical stories that the central figure is painted as having the ability to remain in the queen's chamber position or to remain in the position of priest. However, the energy of humanhood for the Buddha, for the Christ, or for you is part of the equation of self. Without probing too deeply into the Buddhist mindset, shall we say, we may say that for the Buddha, as for the Christ, the rule of magical personality or the robe of Christhood or Buddhahood took over for the human Buddha and the human Christ, what comes down to us through the pages of history then is that Buddha and that Christ, which devotees and disciples of those figures wish to see. One may even take a current saint, shall we say, such as Peace Pilgrim, and from the outside in look upon her life and feel that she had achieved the initiated role on a continuing basis. However, if one were to ask this saintly woman whether she was indeed in her priestly robes at all times, she would say not at all, and she would talk about the struggles that she had on the inner planes of her own heart and her own mind with the day-to-day -day business of being human. Indeed, this instrument read recently that the one known as Mother Teresa wrote many times in her private diaries that she despaired of herself because of her many doubts and fears. That is the difference between looking at a figure such as the Buddha from the standpoint of history and of the religious beliefs of those who devoted to the Buddha and looking at the same life from inside the mind and heart of the one known as Gautama. In the final question, they ask something related to magic that I wanted to include in this. And in the meditative state, if an entity upon sending instructions for desired programming to the subconscious or deeper self, would the deeper self respond in accordance to those instructions? For instance, would the self's perception of self begin to be transformed if an entity, through concentration in a meditative state, told the self over and over, I desire to see through the eyes of love? What kind of power to effect changes do repeated affirmations have? How can one increase the effectiveness of the mantra? We are those known to you as the principle of Quo. There are various aspects to this query which shall cause the flow of our response to be shaped. Our first focus should be upon the query concerning the use of affirmations while in a meditative and concentrated state. We would simply suggest that it is well to untangle the use of affirmations in a concentrated state from the practice of meditation. The practice of meditation is a practice of silence. The times of visualization, affirmation, and other work in consciousness, while equally valuable and worthy of doing, are not the same in terms of that which is required and which is a good resource for that activity as meditation. So let us simply briefly state that it is well to retain times within each day when one practices the presence of the one infant creator, not by thought, by affirmation, or by any other aspect of the conscious human mind, but by listening to the silence which is pregnant with the one infinite creator's presence and truth. We would suggest that affirmations such as the questioner offered are indeed powerful to work with in the subconscious mind. The will of the seeker is carefully focused. The mantra or affirmation of statement itself has been very carefully prepared. The seeker therefore feels that he may trust this affirmation with the whole of his will. He may place the entire burden of his desire upon the realization of the truth of this statement. There are two particularly good times in which you do this work, which occur naturally twice, at least during each diurnal period. These are the moments after one awakens and the moments before one goes to sleep. In this hypnagogic state, your mind is fully collected. It is about to move across that lyman 
of which we spoke earlier, that threshold of consciousness, and enter into the precincts of sleep. Or it is just rising from sleep with its mind ready to focus upon the new day, but not yet full of content. During this state, in both morning and evening, the repetition of such a statement will be quite effective, for it will penetrate immediately into the subconscious without resistance. If, on the other hand, the questioner would desire to set a specific time during the day's schedule for this work, it might be recommended that a period of meditation be followed by the conscious gathering of the forces of self and the repetition of the statement that the seeker desires to itself to hear. We would note that the use of voice in saying the statements out loud is helpful in terms of creating the maximum impression of the self upon the self using this technique. If a thought remains within the mind, it has natural limits of power and is of a certain kind. It is a thought form. If the same thought is spoken out loud and breath has been expended in the saying, it has become sacred. It is not simply a thought form. In the expenditure of breath, it is a living thing and the entire effect is greatly enhanced in that the seeker hears himself. Indeed, tangentially, we would note that there are many times when it is helpful for seekers to speak out loud to themselves, talking to themselves out loud about their considerations, for in developing the sentences that are spoken aloud, the seeker is able to break the cycles of repetition that occur within the mind when it is thinking to itself, and then the seeker hears what he is thinking in a different way. The questioner in attempting to create changes in his consciousness by the use of his will is developing his magical personality. Therefore, we would suggest a certain amount of protocol having to do with these periods of affirmation or statement. That is, at the beginning of this period of affirmation, the collected and fully conscious seeker takes upon himself his magical personality. If he wishes, he may invoke it without words. He may make a gesture which indicates to himself that he has taken on his magical personality, or he may wear a ring or some form of adornment to the body that is only worn during this particular ritual. When invoking the magical personality, polarity is, of course, all important. That polarity may be protected by the simple statement, I desire to know in order to serve. Positive magical workings always have to do with service to the one infinite creator and by reflection to the world and to the self. There is nothing of the worldly self involved in the desires of the magical personality. Consequently, this taking on in a ritualistic fashion of this personality creates a cleanliness and purity to the working which it would not otherwise have. At the end of the working then, the ring or other adornment may be removed, another gesture may be made, or another visualization may be made. This particular instrument uses the visualization of putting on magical robes and taking them off after the working. When this instrument prepares for channeling, however, the protocol is different. She calls the archangels and asks them to place her on limitless white light to breathe. At that time, she asks the archangels to remove the limitless white light when she is through channeling and place her back on ordinary everyday air. In this way, she protects her magical personality from attempting to maintain its purity when the personality shell has once again taken the stage and life is going on in its usual fashion. The magical personality is not a mysterious entity. It is yourself at a different stage of your development. We have called it the higher self. It is your highest and best self. It is a completely magical focused sacred being. It is your gift to yourself from mid six density across all the reaches of infinite space, time and time space. Your higher self or magical personality offers to you the entire array of resources which its vast experience has gathered. You and your higher self or magical personality created the plan for this incarnation and your higher self or magical personality is at all times as close to you as your breathing. The use in a conscious fashion of magical personality is extremely powerful. Therefore, it is well to work careful and lovingly with these energies as you begin to create the changes in consciousness that you wish to create within yourself. As you seek, the question arises, what do I seek? That which you seek is ever and always a part of yourself, a deeper, more fundamental, more true part of yourself. We offer a very simple philosophy in saying all things are one. Yes, that statement has implications and those implications echo and resonate through level after level of awareness. That which you seek, that which all seekers seek is truer, deeper awareness of the self, of the creator, of the 
creation about one. So that use of affirmation or statement in a repetitive, persistent manner is extremely positive in use and well done. Care and deep love need to go into the creation of the statement or affirmation, the creation of the ritual that surrounds the use of that affirmation, and the choice of how to place this beautiful magical ritual within the coils of the day. An earlier query by the questioner to this instrument provoked in our response a discussion of the nature of sound and the use of the voice. And in answering the latter part of your query, my brother, we would focus upon that topic once again. Mantras are extremely powerful, as you have already discovered. Like the affirmative statements, they must be well chosen, for they bore deeply within the mind. When appropriately chosen and full of truth for that seeker, the use of the mantra shall indeed create an immediate change in the vibratory level of the seeker. It is a change in vibration which is not specific. It is a change in vibration which goes to the deepest roots of consciousness. For in the deepest roots of consciousness, the name of every seeker is the one infinite creator. Whatever God name that a mantra contains is the deepest, truest name of the self. You are calling to yourself across the aeons of timelessness and time, spacelessness and space, moving to that one point where you and the Creator are one. That this is meat, as the one known as Jesus Christ says, of which the world knows not. This is drink, after which the seeker shall never thirst. Working with mantras is working with the archetypal mind. In a way, this is also a magical working. However, because of that fact, it is without form. Not being a statement but a name or principle, there is a safety involved in that the mind cannot do anything with that word or God name or naked principle, which is the mantra. And so it lets it go down immediately into the subconscious mind. As with all magical rituals, repetition is a key to the effectiveness and the power of the ritual. That change in consciousness which is sought becomes more and more easily, even effortlessly achieved as the habit deepens of using this mantra. It is, as the questioner said in the round robin discussion before this channeling, a most effective way of smoothing out the bumps in the personality shell. It brings one to a world where suffering and catalyst, light and dark, day and night, are subsumed into a sacred space where all is one and all is well. This being the deeper truth, it informs the lesser truth. So the life is transformed in a way which cannot be explained intellectually, but which nevertheless is very effective. So we have a lot to discuss here, and I will leave a lot of this to your own comments. There's definitely some repetition. I've talked about the higher self in several episodes now, and we get a lot of repetition here. The higher self is a key part of white magic, and the magical personality is donned here. Now, it's interesting. They kind of warn about having the higher self with you at all times, and I'm wondering about that. Uh, so they kind of inform to let go of the higher self at the end of any working. There's a discussion of ritual here that you do something one day, it's not enough. But if you're doing it every day, it doubles in power. And that is one of the keys, an understanding of purifying yourself before so that you let go of any thing that you might be holding, any guilt and forgiveness and more of a discussion of how to go about opening up that magical personality. So I hope some of this touches you and helps you in some ways. Uh, it's not a lot like Abraham Hicks or anything like that. And there's certainly some different spiritual qualities to this kind of channeling, but I found it interesting and hopefully it helps you as well. In any case, all episodes of the reality revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to the Reality Revolution. Mm -hmm.